mentioned that uh, you have never uh, questioned the policy of the government. I want to take uh, two of your reports. One is about coal, the other is about 2G. If the policy of the government is to have cheap power, and if coal has therefore to be sold at a fairly economical rate for the power generating stations to be viable. Now, your premise in the report is that the government must raise the highest amount when it is disposing of the resources. Therefore, by auction, it must have fetched X amount. Therefore, there is a presumptive loss. Equally, in regard to 2G, you quantified a presumptive loss. Now, the government can very well say that by disposing of coal, and that too to units which have a commitment to supply to the uh, distributors at a fairly reasonable price, maybe two, two rupees 50 paise per unit. Now, they can't do it if coal is to be auctioned. And therefore, are you not, in a sense, saying that the government's policy should be to raise the highest resources and not to sell electricity at a cheaper rate? I need to stand up and answer this. I'd love to have taken off my jacket and answered it. <laughs> but since I can't do that in public, I... Mr. Vaidyanathan, yes, that question has been put to us. Let me take them one by one. In terms of the coal report, we have nowhere said coal is, should be auctioned. Not nowhere in our report. Please go through it with a fine tooth comb. We have not even remotely recommended that it should be auctioned. All that we've done is said is 2004, in the month of April, the then Secretary Cole said that coal mine blocks are being allocated on a screening committee procedure. Up till now, from 93, it was all right. There were no demand for these coal blocks. Prices globally for coal have gone through the roof. And he used the expression, now, the allocatees, and he used, used the word allocatees. Normally, we've been saying allotees. The allocatees of these coal mines are making windfall profits. He's used the expression. And hence, he's recommended now we need to go in through a more transparent process of auctioning the coal. Within seven months of his making this proposition, the then coal minister, on 1st of November, has approved this recommendation and said, yes, I agree with the recommendation. I agree the, with the rationale. We need to go in for a process of auctioning the mine blocks henceforth and said, bring forth a cabinet note for it. Of course, from 1st of November 111 till 2010, when the bill was actually introduced in Parliament, all kinds of things happened. All that we've said is, when the decision was taken to allot these mines by auction, why did it take seven or nine years to follow that policy which had been enunciated? We have not recommended, we have not. In the case of the 2G, nowhere have we said that maximized revenue. The planning commission in the plan document has said that should be utilized such that we generate revenues, not maximize revenues, we generate revenues. That was what the finance ministry was saying repeatedly over one and a half years before Spectrum got finally allotted. We have not said maximize revenue. Planning Commission said gener revenue generation, and so did the finance ministry. Now, if you want to ask me about presumptive losses, Auditors, you know it, you're, you've been in this profession, worldwide do enunciate the shortage of revenue, potential losses, and the word presumptive has come not from, is a, not of our creation, it is word presumptive which is in the direct tax code, the word presumptive is in, used by the International Monetary Federation and any number of 
accountants bodies across the globe i'm going to get yamini aiyer to ask the next question i'm going to shift gear a little bit um a lot has been spoken about your reports on coal on t2g but i think the most critical role that you play um is in tracking how money flows all the way down for people's direct and basic entitlements you talked about the naughty books um and that was uh, an extremely important step forward in uh taking uh sort of you know how uh, explaining to the to, to ordinary people how government money flows down but we still have a fundamental problem which is that large numbers of these social sector schemes don't actually fall in your ambit uh so how are we going to deal with that problem uh because ultimately if we're talking about accountability accountability for that ra- last rupee spent for the school for people's pensions for the pds system for healthcare is critical um and yet sy- systemically we seem to have a significant problem and i'm curious to know what your what your thoughts as cag are on how we deal with this problem yeah but four years back you see we conduct audit through an audit act which was passed by parliament in 1971 there was no such thing as a ppp then 73rd 74th amendments had not come least of all was the model that we now follow of the where the ngos the special societies have been created for these implementation of these social sector schemes uh so over the years this model of devolution of government funds did not fall within our automatic legal mandate but 5 years back i made a presentation to the planning commission and indicated to them that 53% of the central sector schemes humongous amount then it was about 63000 crores did not fall within our automatic legal mandate and subsequently we have submitted to, uh, an amendment a proposed amendment to the government we did that in november of 2008 to amend the audit act and ensure that these get fall within the automatic legal mandate of the cag but the government has been pro- proactive pending that legislation being passed by parliament henceforth they always tell the agency receiving the public funds that they will receive the funds only on the condition that they will permit audit by the cag's establishment is deepak kapoor thank you rahul uh, mr rai it was uh, great listening to you uh, as always i think the cag reports in the last couple of years have actually reached the man on the street very well uh somehow the impression which the man on the street gets is that there is no accountability in any department or any institution of the government or no accountability framework so if i were to ask you if you were to choose any one function or any institution in india which has an acceptable or satisfactory accounting uh, accountability framework which one is it and if there is one such acceptable or satisfactory one shouldn't one replicate that all over deepak i thought we were in the same profession you shouldn't be asking me such uncomfortable questions <laughs> uh well it's very difficult it's really very difficult to rate institutions that we've gone through at one point of time we actually went through the process of trying to figure out whether like lots of other auditors general do in other countries rate institutions according to their performance rate state state governments according to their performance but then we realized we were getting into territory which could create problems for us all kinds of comments maybe criticism would emerge so in a large number of institutions which are very well architectured and we look at the rural employment guarantee program itself by design the architecture of the program is excellent absolutely excellent it's been designed very well maybe some points of time in the implementation of the program in the way the delivery schedules are prepared or in the implementing agencies there are some inadequacies and that's what we can come into but yes uh, possibly we need to look into these institutions also which as you say are institutions of best practices and what i should have mentioned in these naughty books 
which we were not doing earlier, and Rahul called us fault finders to the nation, we, if we come across a good practice, earlier we were saying, yes, that's the job, they've done it well. But now if we come across a good practice, we put it up front so that it gets disseminated across states because we are the only guys who see them pan India, pan institutions, pan states. So we put them up in our reports up front itself and say this is a good practice. You might consider disseminating it. Sir, I have a concern. You know, you've built up now a formidable reputation for the institution of the CAG. How confident are you that going forward also, uh, the CAG will continue in the same vein? Because no matter which government, they will try their best to ensure that the next person who comes to do the job that you do uh, will not be half as uncomfortable as you. Uh, Mr. Session created the CEC in, a, in his own image, and in a way, the CEC then reached a certain level and went on to consolidate and grow further. Uh, do you think that after you go, they will find the one bureaucrat who will be most pliant and ensure that no other uncomfortable CAG report ever comes out? Or do you think the institution has now been strengthened so much that that won't happen? <clears throat> it's hardly a question which needs to be answered, but since it's been in the public domain, it's best to try and attempt it. Institutions define their own destiny. Really, single individuals do not make that kind of a difference. And let me assure you, I worked <clears throat> for about 40 years plus. I'm really not that old, but anyway, I've worked for 40 years plus. I've worked in the state, I've worked in the center, I've worked in the public sector also. But in terms of sheer human resource endowment, in terms of sheer professional skills, the Audit and Accounts Department is second to none. They're absolutely professionally the best that you can, that you can get. And the reason, why I'm saying that is the profession is recognized so well abroad. The International Atomic Energy Association, or agency, the World Intellectual Property Organization, two United Nations bodies, international bodies, who up till now had never been audited by any institution outside Europe. We are the first country who were nominated to audit them from last year onwards the recognition of the professional expertise of the human resource endowment of this department. They totally are political. The professional skills are upgraded in national and international institutions year to year. At every stage, maybe 12 years, maybe 18 years, maybe 26 years, these are the three that I can remember, they are sent to institutions where we think that professionally they will be coached to imbibe globally the best that is available in the world. And hence, we built up expertise, which absolutely is remarkable. And believe me, with the strength that the right to information has given us, with the same strength that Information Commission has given us, it will, can, it, the institution is not at the mercy of any one single individual. It will continue, that is the writing on the wall. And the earlier all of us get accustomed to the fact that there is an institution which needs to function in a proper way, the better it is for us to realize and function that much more transparently. Sir, in November 2012, uh, Minister of State uh, in the Prime Minister's office, Mr. Narayan Swami, said that the CAG should be split into a multi-member body. Instead of having one person who's got all powers vexed in him, uh, it should be split into a multi-member body. That will create greater transparency. Former CAG, uh, Mr. Shunglu, accepted that suggestion and said, one person is too powerful if he's CAG. Make it a multi-member body. What do you think, sir? See. There's nothing wrong with that suggestion. There are models, different models all around, all over the world. There are multi-member bodies. These are called courts of audit. Court de Com, for example, France, it's called. They sit as a court. Believe me, their powers are fantastic. They can punish defaulters. Good enough, have a multi-member body, make them sit as a tribunal or a court, let them punish be defaulters also. There are models which is called a commission of audit. Again, <clears throat> they have very far-reaching powers. So in terms of power, it's the poor CAG of India who actually has no power. He just prepares his audit report and plugs it into parliament. 
this suggestion of a multi-member body was made by the Venkatachaya Chalaya Committee, I think in 2002, when it was going into uh, amendments to the Constitution. At that time, the comment from the institution of the CAG was that it should not be made multi-member. But we, in about two years back or three years back, we have said, yes, make it multi-member if you want, but then multi-member means with the attendant powers and responsibilities, and it can be a very powerful body. Okay, Mr. Vinod Rai, for sharing with us your thoughts on accountability and transparency, and for doing the commendable work that you've done. Thank you so much for joining us at the India Today Conclave 2013.